how does one become an economic hitman? Well, I guess the, the first question would be, why would you want to? Because I don't recommend it. Um, for me, how it happened was that uh, when I was graduating, just about to graduate from business school, uh, I was going to be drafted. And I really didn't want to go to Vietnam. I didn't really want to kill Vietnamese people or be killed by them. So I was looking for a way out. And I was married at the time to a woman whose father was very high up in the Department of the Navy. And his best friend was very high up in the National Security Agency, which was draft deferrable. And they arranged for an interview. So I go in for this interview, uh, spent a couple of days on, on a lie detector. And I was sure I failed. Uh, for one thing, when I had been in Middlebury College, I, I, uh, uh, there was an incident with an Iranian, if you can believe that. Be careful with those guys. Uh, Seriously, yeah, well, the truth, truthfully, this guy carried a knife. I mean, a little tiny jackknife, but he showed me how he put his, his thumb way up the blade so there's just a little bit of it touching. He'd already shown me this. He'd been a professional soccer player at the Cl Club of Rome in, 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 in Italy and then, gone to, and then gone to Middlebury College. And we, I was in, a, it, it, we were in a bar together. And, and, uh, What year is this? Uh, 64. Okay. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, a, a big heavy farmer sucker punched me, knocked me across the room, and Fahad, my, my friend from Iran, comes up and slashes him across the cheek. Lots of blood comes out. He's got this little tiny, it's just a pinprick, really, but it looks bad. It feels bad. And the farmer's screaming his head off, and Fahad pushes me into the men's room and out the window into Otter Creek, this river that runs by. <laughs> and we make our way back to the dorm at Middlebury. And uh, the next, and I was pretty drunk. The next morning, there's a knock on the door, and there's the cops. So they pull me into the police station. And uh, as I'm sitting there waiting to be interviewed, another one's escorting Fahad out. They don't let me talk to him. They put, put, take me in, and they start questioning me. Did you see Fahad with a knife? And I lied. I just lied and lied and lied. I feared Fahad more than I feared the police, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, fear Iranians more than I fear the yeah, well, police. The police. <laughs> I've always been told, don't sit too close to them, you know? I, I, I think this is good enough every day. Like this yeah, I'm worried yeah. about him, not me. Yeah. Yeah. I, get this I got a knife yeah. in my left hand right now. Don't worry about that. <laughs> anyway, you know, so now I'm taking this, this NSA uh, lie detector test. And they asked me, have you ever, had a, have you ever been interviewed or had a run-in with the police? And I had to tell them, yeah, I lied to the police. So I figured, well, this is, this is going to screw me. And then they asked me how I feel about Vietnam. I say, well, I, I, don't, I don't intend to go. And so I figured I failed miserably. Got it. But no, they hired me. And you know, oh, they offered me a job. And you know, the, the truth of the matter is, they were very happy that I had the guts to, to, to lie to the police. Plus, Fahad's father was a general in the Shah's air, military mm -hmm. and worked for the CIA. So here I was, friends with a guy whose father was in the CIA in Iran. I was good material. And they knew that we had already lost the war in Vietnam, basically. It wasn't public knowledge, really. It was a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. But the NSA knew, so they didn't care that I didn't want to go. They were pretty smart of me not to want to go there. So it was really funny. So, you know, I get, I get offered this job. And there's a, then, then I end up going in the Peace Corps for three years because they encouraged that to learn another language, to learn survival techniques, et cetera, et cetera. And afterwards, I came out and was hired. And they told me, You know, when you end up working for us, you may not actually work for us. You may work for a private corporation, but they have connections with us, which was true. Mm -hmm. So I became an economist, chief economist at this consulting firm that had very, very close ties to the United States, um, what do we want to call it, intelligence community? <laughs> Information gathering spy agencies. Did yes. you know at that time? Like, are you aware what's going on? No, not really. I mean, you know, it's so easy to convince yourself that you're not aware, even though I had suspicions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I came from a, a poor, pretty poor teacher's family in New Hampshire. I grew up in a boy's boarding school surrounded by rich kids. And my dad was a teacher and he didn't make any money. They, they, we, the school gave us a house and food. We, we had a decent life, didn't want for anything. But I was surrounded by kids who came from Tehran and Paris and Buenos Aires and Park Avenue in New York. And, and you know, I heard all these stories, you know, I was stuck in this little town in New Hampshire always. 
And so, did these kids bully you, or did you have good friendships with them? I had good fr- okay. uh, friendships. I was, pre- I was, I've always been a good con artist. That's what it takes to be an economic hitman, you know. Mm. But <laughs> and I was captain of two sports teams, and so oh, on. Oh shit! Yeah. So, but but I always had this inkling to go to Tehran, yeah. to go to Paris, to go to these places. And suddenly now, as I get into this business, I'm flying first class around the world. I'm meeting with presidents. I'm doing all the things that I dreamed of doing. So I really didn't want to know the truth, even though when I, the more and more I began to suspect it. But the line that I was sold, Patrick, was that what you're doing is a really good thing, because what I was, what I was paid to do mm-hmm. was to convince countries that had resources our corporations covet, like oil, to take huge loans from the World Bank or one of the sister organizations, and hire our companies to build big infrastructure projects like power plants and, and roads and airports in, in these countries which would make our, our, our companies would get big profits. The rich families in the country would prosper because they own the industries, they own banks, they own the things that benefited from improved infrastructure. But the majority of the people would suffer because money was diverted uh, from education, healthcare and other social services to pay off the debts on the loan. And in the end, they couldn't pay the debts, so we'd go back in and say, hey, you owe us. So sell your oil or whatever, copper, whatever the resource was, real cheap, cheap to our corporations without environmental or social regulations. And uh, that was really you know, what my job was. But statistically, you could show that when you invest in these um, infrastructure projects, the economy grows. It does, mm-hmm. it's because we measure GDP mm-hmm. or GNP uh, growth. And that really just measures the very rich. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you want to see the entire podcast, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. 